Journal. From the studios of KSQD in Santa Cruz, The Dream Journal is a weekly show where we explore the healing powers of nighttime dreams through conversations with dream experts and with you. of Carl Jung, who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakens. Today's music is Pastoralize. Does dream sharing increase empathy and insight? Join my conversation with two English professors who say, yes, it does. The Science and Art of Dreaming is their new book. I am your host, Catherine Bell, of Experiential Dreamwork, and welcome to the Dream Journal. The Dream Journal is also a weekly podcast. Please subscribe, rate, and review. But most importantly, tell your friends. This is my main mission of the show is to get people talking about dreams. So why not take the podcast as an opportunity to tell your friends about your dreams? If you're looking for archives, you can find them on Apple Apple Podcasts and Spotify and now available on Amazon Music as well. You can find uh, full archives, too, also at ksqd.org slash the-dream-journal. Okay. <sighs> so, um, I have been sick all week. <laughs> Still sick, even after from last week, listeners will remember. But that's okay. COVID's still out there, and uh, we can get through it. So, I had a dream uh, where I was driving in a car, uh, not sure who was driving, but Max and I were in a car and we're passing past this really familiar dream landscape. And I think, oh, there's that mountain peak. Maybe we should go up there. But I don't say that. Instead, what I say is, you know, let's go check out that meadow down below where those elks graze. And there's something so beautiful and peaceful about going down to the meadow that I get to choose to not climb the peaks. Maybe I get to choose to um, go to the peaceful place. Why not? Um, So that's my dream moment to share. So we have two guests today. Let me first say hello to Mark Blagrove. Hello, Mark. Hello, Catherine. Hi. Hi. So glad to have you on the show. Yes, good to be here. And then we also have uh, Julia Lockhart. Hello, Julia. Hello. Okay. Fabulous. All the way from London, yet you sound like you're right inside my head. <laughs> I love this technology. Okay, so let me introduce our guests. Mark Blagrove is Professor of Psychology and Director of the Sleep Laboratory at Swansea University, UK. He is a past president of the International Association for the Study of Dreams. And Julia Lockhart is Associate Professor at the Swansea College of Art, University of Wales, Trinity, St. David and is a fellow of the Royal Society for Arts. Since 2016, they have undertaken public omen dream discussions with Julia simultaneously painting each dream as part of their Dreams ID collaboration, which has resulted in their 2023 book, The Science and Art of Dreaming. You can find our guest at dreamsid.com. So before we get into this whole thing of, uh, um, of painting dreams, which I love, I think it's wonderful, I'd like to, to start by finding out how you each got interested in dreaming. But maybe let's start with Julia. Tell us a little bit about what first got you interested in dreaming. Well, I had very vivid dreams from very young, very um, visual, highly colorful very strange and I would try to tell them to people and I my own amazement at the dreams I think um, possibly gave me a kind of reputation as somebody who was always talking about dreams Um, and then later on I would make paintings about my dreams um, which was very interesting but then what did interest me most was I went on to do a a, a written MA after doing a BA and an MA in fine art. I did, I went into looking at language and my dreams sort of dried up. So I thought that was really interesting. What's the relationship between language 
and learning of language and writing of essays and possibly um, how you're more encouraged um, to dream and, and, and to find colours and patterns in your dream when you're making art. So that really drew me in. Oh, that is very interesting association. I'm, mm. I'm curious uh, to, to hear that. I have not heard people say things like that before. Thank you, Julia. Mm -hmm. So, Mark, what about you? How did you first get interested in dreaming? I read a book called The Innocence of Dreams by a psychoanalyst called Charles Rycroft, uh, which was released, I think, in 1982. And that said that people dream innocently. In other words, they, they make these dreams that depict their life. So they're, they're not saying anything that's um, completely meaningless. They're, they are met metaphorical depictions of our lives. And they're not trying to hide anything in the Freudian sense. They are they're depicting our lives. So I got into dreams. I did a PhD on the relationship between dreaming and waking life. Then I did lots of research on sleep and memory uh, in the sleep lab for many, many years, which I still do. And then I was interested in dreaming at the same time as a, as a scientific study. And then I started, because of International Association for the Study of Dreams, getting interested in dream discussions. So I did work on the dream discussions and uh, quantitative work on what benefits people get personally from dream discussions. Uh, so I got more and more into the dream discussions and then when I was going to do them even more publicly, uh, teamed up with Julia to, to do so. Mm -hmm. I'm really struck by this concept of the innocence of dreams and that they are just being their authentic self with us in a way, but so often we can't even understand them. That's such a kind of a contradiction, maybe. Yes, I certainly found well, in the dream... Oh, sorry, yes. I, I certainly found on the dream groups and... and it, being a member of dream groups, but also running dream groups, that it very much helps to have other people making suggestions for how the dream is related to the person's waking life. So mm. that that's uh, that sort of overcomes some of the um, inability to spot what what might be there in the dream. Ah, so they kind of fall into our blind spots or something. Even though they're telling the truth, there's something we don't recognize about the truth. Yes, so, so it helps helps yeah. to do it with other people. Julia, what do, what do you have about this? I heard you jumping in. Um, well, it was just um, that they are artworks that we're creating in, uh. um, in our sleep. And, and they're very filmic often. And uh, if we can lucidly dream, we can have some control over them. But otherwise, they are being created by us. And usually we're in them. So we're the kind of star in our dream often. And, uh, and they're built around our, our, our um, experiences. So um, that makes them very individual. And the, uh, they carry a lot of our waking life experiences in them. Mm, yes, yes, there are something very artistic about dreaming, not just the visuals, but even the, the plot line seems often very poetic. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so let's maybe let me find out a little bit about the Omen method of uh, um, of dream sharing. Maybe Mark, would you like to say a little bit about what that is and how um, how how that works in a group, and then how you first thought about including Julia as an artist and how you started to bring art into these groups. Yes, Montague Ullman was a psychoanalyst and psychiatrist, and he invented this method so that lay people can appreciate their own dreams in a group. And it has several stages. It's all written up in his paperback book called Appreciating Dreams. And you, the person tells the dream in as much detail as possible. And then the the main that's the main first stage and that's kept very separate from a second from a later stage in which people talk about their waking life and what's been on their mind uh, whether it's related to the dream or not and then what happens is the group tries to tie together what the person has said about their waking life from what they said about their dream and the very important thing about the process is the the stages and there are other stages to it as well are kept very separate so that as much information about the dream is collected. Uh, so, for example, if you, re if you recall a dream in the night, the idea is don't go s starting to analyze it. Get mm. the dream in as much detail as possible, and then later on talk about your life in as much detail as possible. Uh, 
irrespective of the dream, and then try and match the two, match them together. And so his book is very, very readable on that. So I was doing public discussions on that. And then, as, as you know, I, I said to Julia that I was going to do some public discussions for a science festival. And that's when uh, Julia had an idea about what she could do with it. Hmm. Yeah, Julia, well, maybe uh, jump in and say a little bit about how that idea came to you and what you were thinking about that. Well, um, sometimes these things out, come out of a little bit of grumpiness. And I, I am often <laughs> a bit grumpy that uh, science is is given more Mm. Uh, um, support to um, engage with the public than than the arts are given, particularly in the UK. So I did kind of, I was a bit grumpy about, oh, another thing you've been asked to do. <laughs> so um, I then suggested, I then suggested, well, okay, let's try and bring together the um, the idea of, um, of of dreaming and, and and public engagement. And what about I um, make a, a live drawing of what's mm. happening and initially there were live drawings and then I I, I I mean there's a lot of examples of for example block, block poetry or um, this kind of uh, work where you work on top of other people's texts uh, the the main um, artist that I was aware of was an art a, a, a British artist called Tom Phillips who sadly died um, I think at the end of last year or at the beginning of this year. So it's very, very recent. Hmm. And um, he created a book called The Humument, A Humument. And The Humument was a combination of two other words that he put together after finding a book and creating a character who, who he tells sort of stories about throughout the book by locating the character in the book. So I was aware of this in the history of art and how artists paint on top of books, they paint on top of words. And I saw an opportunity to use Freud's book, The Interpretation of Dreams, as a palimpsest, as, as a, a surface onto which I could create and return the dream to a visual form. But hmm. what happened initially was we, we did this in 20 minutes, so they were very sketchy, but we were both amazed by certain coincidences that were happening as I chose the pages which were done very quickly as you can imagine in 20 minutes I was tearing them out based on the structures and the shape of the um the, the paragraphs and for example at the bottom of the page there might be some italic notes at the bottom and things like that and I was using those elements to create mm. an image and then I was deep diving into the work and finding words from Freud that related to the current dream. So you've got these words from 1900 from Freud's book that are coming up and are circled and are there as key components of, of the person's dream. And we just thought at first, so oh, this would be an interesting kind of transitional object that these mm -hmm. uh, dreamers could take away with them as a, you know, thank you. It was a dream exchange. You know, thank you for sharing your dream with us in exchange. We're giving you this uh, piece of art uh, mm -hmm. that they took away with them, torn from the book. And we gradually realized that, you know, there was something really important here and we were observing our own reactions to it. Uh, and, and this was when we began to notice things to do with empathy and, mm things to do with returning the dream to a visual form and also the use of found poetry, which comes also from the surrealists. So there was a kind of art historical um, trajectory going on in the work as well. Hmm. Oh, that is, uh, that's really interesting. I mean, I, 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 whenever I can, I've gone through various phases of painting my own dreams and I found it's always very helpful and it's also helpful when other people shall share with me their ideas about dreams. But so they're, so you're taking someone's dream and, uh, and creating art around it um, and th providing them that kind of insight. And uh, do you, you also take some of the ideas that other people in the room are, are bringing out about the dream or do you stick, stay really strictly with the dream? No, it's, a, it's completely about the discussion. So the mm. dream is told, we change, we have manipulated or changed the Ullman technique a little bit. So the dreamer tells the dream three times with Ullman. I think it's just once in, in a lot of detail, but we ask for the dreamer to repeat it three times. So there's this immediate slowdown of how you're telling this dream and, 
and hearing yourself in a way telling the dream. And so the whole process lasts about 90 minutes. And within that time, in, in the tradition of, of a, an artistic happening, I will create the work. And at the end of it, I do not go back to the work. So there's a kind mm -hmm. of um, a framing of the work within a particular time um, chosen time slot. Um, and as the discussion develops around the Ullman technique, so there are five stages and they kind of wind. For me, being very visual, I see them like a kind of uh, a spiral where you're winding around the dream and around the dream and eventually you get to the real nub of the dream. Um, and at that point, I'm pulling in all of the, 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 the the discussion that's happening around me. And I go, as much as the surrealists used to do this, into a kind of um, um, a sort of poetic trance almost. I'm, I'm, I'm kind mm. of lost in the visual side of it. I'm doing lots of things. I'm working with the language of Freud. I'm working with the discussion that's going on. I'm also creating an image. I'm working with the structures within the paragraphs. There's a lot going on in my head mm. and I don't speak because that just over overloads me. Right, right. Wow. <laughs> so you really get to contribute an incredibly uh, from the unconscious the mm. way that, in the, uh, the way that artists do so often. Mm. Yeah. When you're drawing, you, you know, you're drawing on your um, your skills and abilities, which have taken, of course, yes. many, many years to develop. But you're uh, kind yes, of yes. reaching a point where you're in a, a level of flow. You're in a flow mm -hmm. state, I should say. Mm -hmm. Probably that's more um, better, better as a as a, a, an illustration than than the idea of a trance, because I'm mm -hmm. not completely out of it. But I mm -hmm. am in a flow state where it's just flowing. And that that goes after the 90 minutes. And then I. I present the artwork and we, Mark and I, you know, did, did sort of have discussions about language quite a lot at the beginning because interpretation within psychology has a very specific meaning. Mm -hmm. And I like to say, well, the piece of work that I create at the end is my interpretation of uh, all of these elements coming together. This is my interpretation. But it's very interesting mm -hmm. that different disciplines uh, own language or words and keywords in particular in very specific ways and there is a kind of gatekeeping when you work in a collaborative project like we do that we've had to take on board each other's understandings of our mm. disciplines right mm. oh uh-huh that's that's wonderful and the, you will actually be doing this process the two of you will bring this process to the IASD in Ashland this June isn't that right you're doing a workshop <laughs> that is yeah. one of version of this Yes, that's right. We've done it at several ISD uh, conferences and uh, they've, they've gone down so well because people, it's a multi-sensory experience for everybody who's there. Not only are they engaging with the dreamer, talking about the dream, listening, they're also seeing Julia's artwork, which is projected onto a massive screen mm. behind the dreamer. And mm -hmm. so it's very uh, multi-sensory. And so they see this painting develop. And then at the end, the dreamer turns around and sees it, and the dreamer is shown the actual artwork on the pieces of paper, which incidentally, the, the publisher of Freud's Interpretation of Dreams allows us to te allows Julia to tear out pages uh -huh. to make the artworks. Uh -huh. And then we, we scan that and then make a, a, an enlarged print. And that later on is presented to the dreamer as an artwork. But yes, we're doing it at IASD, and uh, it always goes down very, very well there. Oh, wonderful. I maybe I'll be able to drop in on you this this time mm. around. So tell me about empathy, Mark. Certainly, I know that the groups that I'm a part of, uh, we just we develop a lot of very deep relationships, um, just this real sense of connection. And uh, uh, and and yet you have uh, your scientist yes. and you know the sweet sleep lab and everything. So what kind of evidence do you have that dream sharing builds empathy? Say a little more about that. Yes. Well, well, first of all, this was a bit of a surprise to us because we, we saw it all what we were doing. Julia and I were doing more as a public service in a way. Mm. We would give an artwork to this person. We would give a, a discussion to them and they would, they would explore their dream and get insights from it. But we slowly started realizing that these discussions were having effects on us and particularly mm. with some people who we wouldn't normally have met in waking in real life. You know, we... Mm -hmm. uh, possibly with experiences that we wouldn't have had. And we were really feeling for them. And our, our book gives examples of those, of, of dreams that were unbelievably poignant. And so when we realized, yeah, we're starting to feel some empathy towards these 
people. Um, I looked in the literature and there was nothing on dream sharing and empathy. There were studies on dream sharing in uh, relationships and uh, why people share dreams and possibly they become closer, but there was no actual study on dream sharing and empathy. Mm -hmm. So I got hold of an empathy scale, which <laughs> measures how much a person feels <laughs> empathy wise towards another person. Ah. And we got uh, we got the pairs of people. Uh, I think we got about 15 pairs in the first study of people and they would fill that they filled that out for each other uh, to about each other so how much empathy does one person feel towards the other person you know how much do they appreciate their life circumstances how much do they understand their emotions how much do they feel for them and understand what they're going through in their life so they filled that out that gives us a baseline and they then shared a dream with each other uh, only one of them would tell a dream so they would tell one dream they would possibly tell up to four dreams across a period of a few weeks mm -hmm. and then after each time when they shared a dream they would each complete that questionnaire again and what we found was that the dream sharer did not have a change in their empathy towards the other person because you know the dream sharer isn't really learning much more about the other person and the the discussion is all about the dream sharer's dream and life but the person who was having the discussion with them had a significantly increased level of empathy towards the dream sharer and uh, so this was the first time this was ever studied in an experiment we also found that there's a there's a trait for empathy you know your level of empathy in general so it has questions on it like you know if somebody is humiliated in front of you do you feel sorry for them mm. and obviously an, an empathic person would say yes i do uh, or um so it was it was that type of question on the empathy questionnaire if you see someone crying do you do you um attempt to to um make them feel better and what we found was that people who are higher on trait empathy are also higher on sharing dreams. So oh. we, we mm. put all that in, into a big paper in a, in a journal called Frontiers in Psychology, which is a very major science journal. And uh, we've, it, it's got enormous um, publicity and, and citations of it. But it was the first time that it was shown that dream sharing can increase empathy uh, towards the, the person sharing the dream. Huh. Well, that's something that certainly we could use a lot more of <laughs> in our mm, society. Yes, yes. But it's, uh, there's also an interesting little piece there about the people who are already are high in empathy are, are ones who are attracted to dream work. Yes, that's right. They may want to listen to other people's dreams or they may tell their own dreams. And indeed, they even had a higher appreciation of dreams as well. There's a personality scale called positive attitude to dreaming. You know, it's whether or not you, you think dreams might be important versus you think dreams are just nonsense and should be ignored and the people who share them should be ignored as well. So uh, we were finding there that uh, people with a higher level of empathy and connectedness with other people were higher on at their positive attitude to dreaming as well as the, the frequency with which they shared and listened to other people's dreams. Well, I'm getting a little flash of why I, one of the reasons why I enjoy this IASD conferences so much, because people there, if they're attracted to dream work, are probably already high in empathy. So we just have yes. a, a lot in common, I guess. That's, yes, that's true. And the other thing about the ISD conferences is, of course, that it's, it's completely multidisciplinary. So there are the yes. scientists, there are the um, therapists, there are people who are just interested in dreams for, for personal reasons, mm -hmm. anthropologists, everything. So yep. if artists, it hadn't been for yep. yeah, art, artists, clinicians, therapists, if it hadn't been mm -hmm. for going to those conferences, then this, the collaboration between Julia and me wouldn't even started because there wouldn't have even been that uh, level of knowing that such collaboration is possible. Uh, okay, thank you. So this is Mark Blagrove and Julia Lockhart. My name is Catherine Bell, and you are listening to the Dream Journal. Uh, we are broadcast live from the KSQD studios in Santa Cruz and co-broadcast live in San Jose at KCXU. And, and of course, on the podcast everywhere starting on Monday. And we will be right back. I have some topics to talk about, including Freud's famous patient, Dora. And we're going to mm. get into a little bit about the theories and function of dreams. Be right back.
So this is the Dream Journal, and uh, we have live with us from England, Mark Blagrove and Julia Lockhart. And I um, hear that we now have a phone call. Welcome to John from Santa Cruz. Hello, John. Hello. Hello. Hey. I, I, have a question. I have a question about the physical component of my dreams. Um, m- multiple times a month, I I can be in a dream, and like I've, I've fallen back into a rose bush, and I actually feel the, the thorns pierce my skin. Um, and then also taking that a little bit you know, different rock, uh, if I'm with somebody, I can touch their skin and I can feel the warmth and the suppleness of the skin. What is that all about? <laughs> mm, what do you think? Mark, what do you have to say about that? Any ideas? Yes, that's very interesting, John. That's, that's actually quite fortunate that you're able to do that because most dreams are simply visual and uh, visual and hearing. There may be a little bit of, you know, pressure on the feet, possibly if you're walking around, but most of them are are visual and hearing. Smell is very, very rare. And so is touch is very, very rare. But we can do both of them. They're just they're just Uh rare. And you are, in a way, a a fortunate person to be able to have that as a component of the dream as well. Hmm. It's really Uh, fortunate to be able to do that. It's fun. Uh Mm, I wonder if in waking life, if you're a little bit more sensate in that way than other people are. Have you noticed that by any chance, John? Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. Okay. And then there's one thing, you know, relative to the physical that I can perceive. Like I said, if I've fallen back into like a rose bush and I felt the thorns, but if I get in a physical altercation in my dream, like a fight, I never feel a a blow to my body. It's Hmm. just those subtle things uh, on the, on the, on the skin sensation and, and that. So, it's just it's it's good to be a, a human and be able to experience that. <laughs> I yes, love that. yes, that's right. Uh, yes, uh, there's a thing for for people who are called highly sensitive persons, which is a, a personality trait, and one uh, of the things in there is uh, a feeling of either discomfort or interest on textures. That they're they're uh-huh. much more concerned for the textures of things. So so possibly you've got that in your dreams because of uh, a higher level of sensitivity to. Uh, to stimuli, but also the imagined stimuli you have when you're asleep in dreaming. Interesting. Yeah, and maybe it's just as well to not feel the body blows. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, one last thing on, on the emotional component of, of dreams. I was in graduate school, and I, was, I had to study all the time. And in my dream, I would be in a three-story Victorian building, and I could climb out on the roof on the top stories, and I could see all my friends down below playing and having a good time. But I knew I couldn't go down there because I had to study. Mm. Oh, wow. Even dreaming about being conscientious. That's quite something. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. And was that well, a recurrent dream? Oh, uh, yes. 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 Until I left until I left school, and I haven't had it since, and that's been almost oh, 40 years ago. Yeah. Oh, well, lucky you. Many of us still dream about our school years. <laughs> Maybe you're done with yours. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. I appreciate you Thank guys. you. Thank Thanks, you John. so much, John. Thanks for sharing. That. Yes, absolutely. And we have another uh, person on the lines. This is Stephen Pop from The Garden Show, who is the show that immediately precedes ours. He has a dream that he would like to share. Indeed. Good morning, Catherine. Good Mark, morning, Stephen. Julia. Good morning. Yeah, actually, Good actually morning, I'm, Stephen. Morning. I'm in the studio with Rick right now. So uh, um, the dream that uh, I had uh, earlier this week, it, ever since talking to Catherine about dreams, I've been recording my dreams and paying more attention to them than I normally do, Uh, but this particular dream stood out on its own. Uh, In this dream, I went to visit uh, a good friend of mine who's a fellow horticulturalist and plant collector. Um, He, unlike me, does not keep any animals of any sort, but in the dream, I go to visit him, and he says, Steve, and we're always surprising each other with new plants and things, but he says, Steve, I've got to show you this 
tell me what you think of this. And he opens the door to a bedroom. And there, in the middle of the floor, is the biggest black snake I have Mm. ever seen in my life. And it is hooded. Uh, It is a black cobra. But unlike uh, a normal snake that would be coiled up in a circle, this is in a square. Uh, it's it's geometrically squared with its coils, um, and it rears its head up. And now I'm I'm not particularly frightened of snakes. I grew up with snakes. I have had many a close encounter with rattlesnakes and such in the Sierras and in, in uh, Northern California. And I, I I don't dislike them or have any phobias around them. But cobras are kind of a different thing. And this thing starts to come towards me. And I'm like closing the door saying, Rick, what what is this? What is this about? And the snake manages to go underneath the crack of the door. And I'm backing up thinking, oh, my God, you know, what what is this? Well, the snake comes right up to me. It doesn't bite me. It starts to climb up on my body, on my (laughs) shoulder. And I notice that unlike... A normal scaly snake. This thing's velvety, um, in in its uh, it's very very tactile for me. It's velvety, and it proceeds to go up onto my shoulders and just nuzzle my ear uh, with its mouth. Now it's interesting, and the dream ended at that point or moved on. <clears throat> but it's interesting to me hearing you talk about drawing or artwork from dreams because. I was so uh, taken aback by this squaring of its coils that I started trying to, I'm not a great artist, but I started to try to do a uh, rudimentary rendering of this thing. And it wasn't coming out right. It wasn't coming out right. Well, I had kept putting the snake's head on the outside of the square, and it wasn't until I drew it with it on the inside of the square mm. that, it, that it made sense to me. But of course it doesn't make sense to me. None of it makes sense to me. It's <laughs> just, that's why I'm, I'm sharing it with yeah. you. Interesting, but something resolved when you changed the position of the head. Yes. Yeah. I wonder, Julia, what do you have anything to say about this? Like when you were well, with just, artists drawing dreams? Yeah. Yeah. I just thought how, how much like an un organic object Mm. this is so you've got the idea of of plants you know you've got a friend who's a horticulturalist Mm -hmm. and yet this object that you're looking at this strange snake Mm -hmm. is coiled almost like something digital Mm. um yeah it has a kind of um digital sense to me and the blackness of it Mm -hmm. is is almost like um you know the empty screen of a of a of a of an iPhone or of a mm. of a you know one of those phones which is is kind of very um, square as well or a computer screen that mm. blackness but then when it changes to velvety and then you can feel this velvety mm-hmm. there's a a move towards it being it's nuzzling you it's climbing onto you and it's uh. nuzzling you and it's far more um, of an organic object. I mean, the, the velvet, there's a lot of leaves that have that kind of velvety mm-hmm. sense to touch, mm-hmm. aren't there? Yes. Um, I, I can think of some here in, in, in England that are, that are um, called rabbit's ears. Oh, sure. And you touch them and they're kind of a minty green color and you touch them and they're, they are like velvet. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's a transition because I don't know very much about you, but because you work in a, in a in a in a radio um, station, I wonder if there's something about the online, the digital world that is transforming into this velvety, sensual world when you go to your garden. So that mm. there's two worlds that you're experiencing. But no, that that's much. my immediate. I don't know if any of that mm. means anything to you or. 
Well, it's, it's interesting in that I've <clears throat> probably always been a technophobe um, uh -huh. <laughs> for most of my life. I've mm. overcome that in recent years, and, and you know, things like phones and computers are just tools to be used any more than a hoe or a, a spade or something. But, um, yeah, it, it definitely had a very non-organic uh, shape to it to begin with. But then I'm used to snakes being very, not, not velvety or tomatose or having no. any kind of, you know, Mm. fur um and this was very smooth very soft and the minute it touched my body and started to climb me it was i was sort of just giving in and saying well if it hasn't bitten killed me now it's not going to <laughs> and i was completely mm. completely relaxed mm. at that point and like mm. i said i've handled snakes and i've you know and I have a lot of respect for the poisonous ones. I mean, the ones that bite you are the ones that you try to pick up. But, uh, yeah. but this no, one was coming up on you. No, it was coming you up on me. I wasn't right. trying to pick it up. No, I was trying to get the hell away. Yeah. <laughs> and they're very sort of muscular, aren't they? And, mm -hmm. and they are oh, very yeah. defined in their, in their, the, 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 the sort of barriers of them to the earth or the ground that they they go on it's very they're very defined aren't they um and it, it also makes me think of uh, the greek symbol the um caduceus mm, yes there we go yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, the after image in my mind when I was thinking about the dream was of the, uh, the Naga spirits, uh, of the land. Um, I am a Buddhist, but, uh, you know, I don't know how much that plays into it. Uh, but yeah, it, it definitely had weight. It definitely, it mm. wasn't just like a plush toy. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. What an well, interesting for, dream. Yeah. It is. Mm. It's a fabulous dream. Mm. Um, for me, one of the things that I would treasure about the dream is the feelings, like the sensations, mm. like starting with the kind of sense of surprise of seeing it in a square. But then then as it touches you, you described relaxing and totally changing mm -hmm. the way you felt. And so I would I would explore those feelings, those literal sensations mm. and mm. just to see there's something there. There's some value there in uh, um, in having that feeling since the dream is mm. evolutionary derived product is has some value we don't need to understand what the value is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for it to be valuable yes you, you, you yes you, you can steve just have it in in the sense of this was an experience of, of an animal mm -hmm. like this that most people would have thought was frightening but no it's after the square mm -hmm. it becomes just on you in a in an almost friendly unthreatening way but but as Catherine has just said you know you you could leave it at that or you could try to explore whether it makes you think about anything in your waking life you know the mm -hmm. the organic side of yourself yeah. and, and your work or the the technical side or animal side well I've, I've certainly been thinking along those lines and the animal side particularly because i, I do have animals and, and live with a lot of them but uh yeah it, it's definitely uh, i actually treasure the dream i'm i'm mm -hmm. actually very happy mm -hmm. to have had it uh, it's not troubling uh -huh. for me just confusing with that whole mm -hmm. inorganic squaring uh, uh geometric mm -hmm. thing right well there's something innocence going back to the the beginning of mark's comment about the innocence of dreams or something they're very um, beautiful about this. It just mm. is. It, it is what it is. And I love how you're honoring the dream, Steve, by drawing it, taking mm. time to really feel into what, how it wants to be drawn, and mm -hmm. then talking to us about it. Thank well, you. Well, I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Mm. Thank you. All right. Well, take care, Steve. I hope we all be in the studio and get to see you next week. <laughs> in, enjoy your pajama time. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Bye now. Excellent. Okay. So wonderful. Interesting how both of those dreams had to do with uh, physical sensations, which as you so mm. rightly mentioned, Mark, is, is pretty rare in dreaming to it's have. Pre it's pretty rare. Yes. And yet both of those dreams had, uh, just had, uh, physical sensations. Yes. That re that really does make the dream a sort of an environment yeah, to be like yeah. that. It's not just a hallucination. It's, it's an environment that you're in and you can actually feel it. That's uh, that's a very important part of, um, dreaming and how dreams are seen from an artistic point of view, but also from a, a scientific point of view as, as an environment you're, you're oh. really connect, you're really within. Mm. Mm. I like to think of that a way of thinking about the dream, the environment that the dream just puts us in a particular environment and yeah. there's some, yeah. something beneficial about that environment. Otherwise, why bother? Mm. Yes. And you mm. know, we don't know why. 
So we probably have time for about one more topic. We have a couple different ones on the table. And I wonder, do you two have a, a priority topic? There'll be time at the end for contact information and uh, announcements about the book and things like that. Um, so we have, what, do you, what are you most interested in? bringing up at this that's, point that's very difficult because there's there's three big, big <laughs> yes, there's, <I> three, know. <laughs> there's three big things in the book about the link with surrealism and surrealist films ah, okay. and then there's a whole thing about um human self-domestication which is the idea that oh. the humans have domesticated each other like we've done with cats dogs and horses Absolutely. and so the karma the karma humans are sort of preferred for mating with a lot of the time and humans have become domesticated and maybe dream sharing has been a part of that but in our book science and art of dreams we've also got a whole chapter on freud's famous patient dora who uh the the dora case because she was so young and being sexually harassed by somebody is mm -hmm. usually taken as a criticism of freud but it's um he recorded her dreams and her dreams are beautiful depictions of her troubled life and julia then made two paintings of them so uh, whichever of those uh <laughs> catherine or julia wants we're, we're happy with well i have to say that i think you were, you were about to all three of those are about to be trumped because we have another caller all right <laughs> <laughs> great you never know what's going to happen so on these shows i love it so we have ray from santa cruz on line one and i want to say hello to ray Hello, Catherine, and all your fine, fabulous guests. Um, I, 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 I didn't want to get in the middle of the conversation. I just had another uh, dream that, <clears throat> um, excuse me, uh, has to do with the animal realm. And uh, mm. I was, I was uh, attending like a, uh, almost like a, a maypole ritual or something. There were a number of people out uh at some kind of a celebration i got like this feeling of being at stonehenge or something i didn't really see that um and, and there's this like giant grizzly bear who's part of the mix um which oh just reminded me of something a couple of uh, bear dances i went to back way back in the day but this was not one of them either maybe maybe it had some kind of previous correlation in my mind going back there but but anyway what happened in the dream was there was this big bear and he, he wasn't like being part of the celebration like they would have been at a bear dance um the this one was just like kind of standing there and there looking at everybody but they were you know all good with this bear standing there watching him oh that was cool but then i'm maybe 50 feet away or so as i watch this and I see, and the bear all of a sudden looks at me, and I get kind of afraid, thinking, oh, my God, this bear, you know, has it in for me. So I um, kind of get farther away from this crowd of people and see this cabin that I'm going to go in and protect myself from this bear. And the second I get in the cabin and I... I try to lock this door. It has just a little flimsy, like a hook and eye lock on the inside of it. And the first thing I think is, well, that's not going to keep a bear out. But then, sure enough, as, I, as soon as I get in the <clears throat> cabin, this bear breaks the door down. And then um, I, uh, I scurry up into this little loft that's at the back of this cabin. And... Um, the bear comes in, and he's tall enough to where he could basically, you know, reach this cab, uh, the, this loft that's about eight feet above the floor. He can reach this loft, and I have this feeling that he could just grab me and do whatever he wants with me. But he just kind of stops mm. right there and looks at me, and that's where the dream ends. Oh, so oh wow! Well. Have any insights about any of that? <laughs> Well, it's, oh, there's a parallel there with uh, with mm. Mark, uh, with Steve's dream of, uh, um, of the of something that could be dangerous, mm. but it and it isn't because it, it, I mean it's chasing me in the dream, but mm -hmm. I don't actually get caught. Right. Mm. Yeah. It, it is in, I mean, in my dreams all the time. Actually, I never uh, get caught. Thank uh, God. But anyway, um, Julia, yeah. Yes, I was just going to say that there is this um, connection with nature 
in both of the dreams um mm -hmm. where where as as you're saying it's not as as frightening as possible it could be and maybe that's something to do with our um human condition that we have this world that we've created that is so separate from nature you know we live in in these houses which are no longer necessarily made from the environment that you know the the wood not necessarily chopping down the wood from the area and don't right. necessarily fit in with the area so we have this mm -hmm. distance from our from our n n native sort of natural environment and maybe the grizzly bear in that way is is, is a part of that fear of this but actually it isn't frightening it's just there and it it just wants to be near you and to watch you to look at you um very interesting uh i think what color is the bear is he a black bear i mean is yeah. grizzly brown well it's the bear is actually its fur is black for sure and right. you know i uh, the bears i've seen uh, well, I've never actually been up right close to one, but the, you know, I've seen lots of photos of them and stuff, and they range from really black to reddish, really yes. light brown. Um, yeah. And this one was a very, you know, almost pure black, dark, dark bear for sure. Mm. And see, there's something oh. quite menacing about black, as as similar yeah, to the. Black um, was in the the last gentleman's nature, yes, is the black yes. snake too. Huh? It mm. has this sort of again. Oh, the one. Has this mm. connotation of of a of a negative space, almost of something we can't quite get an understanding of, because very visually much like a bit of the subconscious, something that we're yes, not really yeah, a, a conscious yeah. of. Well, Ray, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up at this moment, and I I'll, I'll like give you a similar uh, idea that I gave to Steve, which is perhaps it's the feeling of this being and being the bear chasing me that that there's something about this that's familiar from waking life or it's something that's coming from inside of me there's something about this and even what mark was saying at the dream as an environment so i just invite you to explore the yeah. sensations well i like that what uh, what she just said about uh, uh our environment and our houses not really necessarily being built from it uh, natural materials anymore because I'm a builder too, so I think oh, about that kind of thing a lot. So maybe <laughs> you picked up on that too. Mm. Hey, well, thank you so much for all, right. all being there. Thank we'll you. talk to you soon. Take all right, thanks, thanks a lot, Ray. Thanks, Ray. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye now. So, what is the best way to get in touch with you? You have your webpage, dreamsid.com, and I'll just say this is Mike, uh, Mark Blaygrove, and Julia Lockhart um, from England again. So, dreamsid.com. Is there any other? Um, place for people to get in touch with you or any what else would you like to share with our listeners well lo lots of the julia's artworks are on there and and science papers and and articles in art journals about uh, what we've been doing mm -hmm. um if people wanted to order the book they could ask the kind folks at bookshop santa cruz to order the the science and art of dreaming and it, it's been riding high on amazon if people although we prefer people to go to bookshop santa cruz uh, no, for, that's for good. Appreciate it, that. If they could. So, uh, um, <laughs> but we are on dreamsid.com and uh, we're on Twitter, dreamsid, and we're on Instagram, dreamsid underscore artworks. Okay, thank you so much. It's so good to have you guys on the show. Um, I will see you in, in Ashland in June. Yes, look forward to it, Catherine. Uh, thank you very much it, for inviting us. Yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, thank you, KSQD. All yes. right, thanks. Okay, and thank Goodbye. you, listeners. So glad to, that you tuned in. The Dream Journal is produced at the studios of KSQD in Santa Cruz, California. Um, I am Catherine Bell. Find out about my dream coaching practice at experientialdreamwork.com. You can email me at katherine at ksqd.org. That's K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E -E at ksqd.org. You can follow Experiential Dreamwork on Facebook and Instagram to find out about upcoming shows. I'd like to thank Rick Kleffel, engineer and music creator. You can find the ambient music at pandemiad.com. I'd like to thank Tony Rissomano for the phones, Eva Malady for audio editing. Intro music is Water Over Stones. This outro music is called Everything, both by Mood Science. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, Take a minute to write down your dream and bring it to the next dream journal. Cheers.